Just stop the nonsense. Jonah is mythology. Swallowed by a giant fish for three days and three nights, then spit up and goes into the heart of the Assyrian Empire, Nineveh, preaching repentance. And then all of a sudden, they repented. And that this somehow is historically evident in the fact that the power of the world at the time, the Assyrians, their power waned. They were a cruel nation. And that somehow, well, how did they stop ruling? They repented. Now, I don't know if this is some joke because technically it looks bad. Repenting causes you to lose the power. But Dr. Joshua Bowen answers this question, diving deep from a questionnaire of our Patreon here at Myth Vision and shows you, no, what they're really doing is... Dr. Joshua Bowen, we've got a question from WM Law on my Patreon. Derek, I'm only on page 124 of his book. Being ex-Mormon, ex-Reformed Christian, who's read the entire Old Testament, chapter one was a recap of the biblical story that I'm familiar with. My question relates to the Assyrian kingdom. Hmm. As a Christian, we would be told that the Assyrian kingdom was a brutal kingdom that terrorized its neighbors and gave no quarter, but that there was a period of time when it, wa when it waned. The Christians would say that 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 is evidence of Jonah having preached to the Ninevites and them repenting. Is there any evidence of such a period in the archaeological record? A period of them repenting? Well, it's, the Ninevites? it seems like they waned from being such cruel overlords, if that makes sense. And, and so Christians will say, see, Jonah did preach repentance from their wicked cruelty. You so, see? So, I mean, no. Um, <laughs> Um, so, you know, taking the book of Jonah like that, trying to look for historical, um, you know, seeing this as some sort of a historically, uh, reliable account of Jonah's life, is probably not a good way to go about engaging with the text. One of the things that's clear about, um, ancient Near Eastern history, and you can see it with the, the Assyrians uh, quite clearly, is there is, th there is this um, uh, pattern of expansion when a nation is strong and contraction when a nation is weak. And normally it hinges upon the ruler himself. So if you have a strong, sort of aggressive, uh, clever ruler, you'll see expansion You'll see annual campaigning, particularly out to the west um, from Assyria, and this, this you know, growth of Assyria proper uh, and, and, you know, taking over, uh, creating vassals and getting tribute and those sorts of things. Um, so one of the kings that sort of epitomizes this big expansion after a period of contraction is Tiglath Pleaser III. And he comes to the throne in 745. So, you know, eighth century, this is something that would be important to, um, you know, the history of the nation of Israel. And we see this reflected in the biblical text. So the Neo-Syrian Empire has its periods of, you know, real strength. I talk about in the book how uh, toward the end, the Neo-Syrian Empire s starts to wane um, and there are probably a lot of different reasons why it happened. Uh, not because Jonah went and preached to them and they decided to give up their, I don't know, um, militaristic ways, you know, first of all, the, the picture that's, you know, painted of the Assyrians or the Canaanites or the Amalekites or any of these people, of course, is that they're grossly immoral and wicked. They do everything horribly and they're just terrible. And um, of course, hopefully we all recognize this a bit of propaganda going on here. And of course, the Neo-Assyrian Empire did this as well, right? So if you read through Mario Liverani's book, for example, on Assyria, which is actually right here, um, you know, you'll see him talking about 
how the Assyrians portrayed themselves and justified their holy war, right? And when they did that, what they did is much as the uh, Israelites did, and much as every ancient people would have done in this position, you, you create an other, right? That you, you have to bring into subjection, bring into control. And the way that you justify doing that is, you, you know, you don't say, uh, I just want to go conquer those people, right? Because, sorry, that's my three-year-old up there. Um, you know, because that doesn't look good. Right? It doesn't reflect well because there's still this idea that you have to have justification for doing what it is that you're doing, uh, and the gods don't the gods don't look kindly in in, in the ancient Near East uh, upon people doing oppressive things. Much to everyone's surprise, you know, uh, maybe that's in uh, fundamentalist evangelical uh, circles. You know, the idea that the ancient Mesopotamian gods would have been against oppression, right? They were, right? You don't oppress the poor. You don't oppress the weak. So they, the king still needed justification for doing these types of campaigns. And so one of the ways that they do it is the same way that you see in the Hebrew Bible. And that is they, like, vilify the other side. Go figure, right? It's how we all do this. You know, you, 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 you think about the way that the Germans are portrayed when you watch, um, you know, like uh, like Captain America or something. You know, the Germans are always the, the, the super bad, right? Um, and I, that's that's not to say that the Nazis weren't bad. Of course they were bad, right? But, like, it can spread to all Germans, for example. Anyway, the point is that uh, that might, have, might not have been a good example. Um, I want to be clear that the Nazis were horrible, right? Just be clear. Right. Um, but that vilification, that type of vilification, is something that you see in the ancient world all the time. And uh, so because of that, the Assyrians would say, those people out to the west, the god Asher, our god Asher, extended his benevolent arm to them to bring them in and to care for them. And blah, 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 right? And of course, right. they, and of, they rebelled. They rebelled against his arm. And so... Uh, I, I have to go out and conquer them. Yeah. Same thing seems to like take place kind of in the Canaan, um, or even another example biblically uh, would be when the vilification of all the kings of the north come from the southern writers. Mm. I mean, yep. y y are they really that bad and that horrible of a king in the north? Or is this a anachronistic explanation saying, well, the reason why yep. this happened, all these bad kings happened to be there, or why did, why, and this I'm leading into the Assyrian thing, is like, why did they stop being so, well, maybe they lost power. Like when yes. Egypt, the reason why the Exodus, you know, if we have yeah. this story as Ronald Hendel talks, well, what happened was they kind of went bankrupt and yeah. they collapsed and yeah. now, boom. Yeah. I mean, this is what happened at the, in the, tw you know, right around 1200, right? So if, if people are interested in that sort of thing, Eric Klein has a phenomenal book, it's right there, uh, called 1177. And uh, we'll have him on the show here, I think, pretty soon. But it talks about this, you know, regional collapse, international collapse. Um, but you know, like a, a, a good example, maybe maybe the German one wasn't all that all that good. It was, but you see this in the vilification of um, uh, people from Arabic countries after 9/11. Yeah. Right. Everybody from the Middle East was then vilified, right? And you saw it horribly here in the United States, right? Now, certainly these terrorists were terrible, terrible people. They did terrible, terrible things. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was on active duty when that happened in the Air Force. Um, but that doesn't mean that all Arabic people are bad, right? And so they, they get vilified, they become the other, they become the other. And that justifies you know, the, 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 the sort of... Um, well, then we get the same thing with racial tensions, too. Yes. Blacks are all bad in, in some people's eyes. Or you look at these, uh, you know, these cross-burning Ku Klux Klan members, and yeah. now all, we, all whites sure. are the same way. You know, you can get the same thing happen sure. in almost any situation. And, and so, so then if, if you're... But the, the, I think for me, the material point is if you're trying to justify... Uh, just like somebody in the Ku Klux Klan wants to justify their hatred, 
just like um, you know people that were incredibly anti-Semitic against uh, the Jews during uh, World War II. Um, anybody that wants to look at all Arabs and justify that bigotry uh, as, as, as being, again, as being justified, as okay to do, they're going to construct this narrative of the other, and they're going to say that the other side um, is doing things oftentimes that they would never do, right? What do they call that? Um, um, uh, virtue signaling, I think is what they call that. But that, so, so what we see then in uh, the biblical text is this sort of othering, and we see it um, with the new Assyrians as well. A, a really good example of this, I, and I, I feel like I want to clarify this because uh, this came up recently in my book uh, on the chapter on the uh, on archaeology, talking about the Canaanites. There is this sort of vilification that you see. Uh, of the Canaanites when it comes to child sacrifice. You see it all over the place in the Hebrew Bible. Oh, they're, they're sacrificing their children to Molech, right? They're doing all these horrible, horrible things. And so I asked the question uh, that Heath Durrell asked, and, and that is, like, what, let's, let's get to the bottom of what evidence do we have for uh, child sacrifice among the Canaanites? And as it turns out, there isn't much, right? So then the question that we have to ask is, all right, sure. Um, you, you know, it, it, do we expect to have a lot of evidence for child sacrifice, like physical evidence in the archaeological record? Probably not. Um, but what evidence do we have that people are using to justify their position, to justify the position that the biblical text is, is historically reliable? And the evidence that they're using is late evidence. It's from Carthage. It's not from Canaan. And so what evidence do we actually have from, you know, Canaan proper, nothing really solid, right? And so then if that's one data point that's, all right, we don't have this positive evidence, so then what other evidence do we have? Well, we, we seem to have evidence in the narrative of the Hebrew Bible that the Israelites were also practicing child sacrifice. So with those two things combined, we don't have any positive evidence uh, from the period to say that, yes, in the second millennium, we've got child sacrifice. And that's why the Israelites had to come in and do this conquest. And we have seemingly positive evidence that the Israelites are doing this in the first millennium, which is the time that we probably think this Exodus story came to its, you know, its, its form. Um, those two things combined, what's more reasonable to conclude? It's this othering. It's this othering that we see. And so, again, uh, the, the, the New Assyrian Empire is othering and doing these campaigns. But when they don't have the strength to do it anymore, sort of bringing this back, when they don't have the strength to do it anymore, they're, they're having to deal with problems, financial problems, they're having to deal with rebellions, they're having to deal with local issues, and all of those things make a, a, an administration, a, king, you know, a kingdom, focus in on itself in the same way that if you're having problems at home, it's difficult to go you know, be successful doing something outside of the house because you have to deal with your own problems internally. And when you have internal problems, the empire tends to shrink back in on itself. And so it's a really convenient thing to say, ah, well, in 586, I mean, not in 586, sorry, in, um, in uh, seven, I was thinking a bit of the fall of Jerusalem, um, but in, uh, you know, 712, 710, when the new Assyrian empire falls to the Neo-Babylonian empire, Neo-Babylonian empire, uh, you know, this is sort of the culmination of all these things contracting the new Assyrian Empire in. And um, I think it would be foolish to say, well, it's, you know, leading up to that, that the contraction that we see, that must be because, you know, we see repentance from Nineveh uh, because solely because we have that in the biblical text. I don't think that's good historiography. Thank you.